Welcome you all once again to the third session, Medicines and Health Devices Regulation. And a really interesting conversation. I hope you are all taking some notes. And we are so thrilled to be here with Dr. Mark Baron, a PhD and founder and general manager of Intersectoral Forum to Fight NCTs in Brazil. He was one of my mentors in this pathway. And we'll also have Natalie Berry of Patient Engagement of European Medicines Agency, Bernardo Sembrun, Senior Director of Global Regulatory Policy in Latin America MSG, Begonia Nanta, Coordinator of the Patient Participation in Research Instance from the Bay in Barcelona, and Daniel Marin, which is a member kit of the same hospital. You can find their full biographies on the official first virtual Latin America Patient Congress page on my Apple's website. And you can also use the Q&A, leave your questions, and now Mark Barone at the Thank you very much, Stefania. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, among many friends. And I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation to moderate this particularly important session to our region on medicines and health devices regulation. So uh, in this session, we will look at uh, what good uh, participatory medicines regulation systems are, how they benefit people living with health conditions, and what role we can play in them. It will also address how people can engage with regulatory bodies and co-create and build back better regulatory ecosystems. For this, we will learn from distinguished speakers from Europe and Latin America. And before introducing them, I would like to invite everyone to visit our booth, the forum DCNT's booth in the exhibit halls, where we are sharing materials for meaningful engagement of people living with and a just published guide on language matters. I would emphasize that in the forum DCNTs, we have been partnering with multiple global organizations from the different sectors to make sure that people living with non-communicable conditions are always heard and participate with both power in any and all decisions that may affect them, including in medicines and medical devices development, incorporation, and regulation. I would also like to remind everyone to use the Q&A and send your questions uh, during the presentations. They will be addressed uh, to the speakers after so they are, they are presentations for our discussion. And uh, so I will now uh, briefly present our, our speakers uh, and then call them in this same order. So the first one will be Natalie Baer, who is responsible for patient engagement in the European Medicines Agency. Natalie has tested and implemented various methodologies and today the patient's voice is included all along the regulatory life cycle of medicines at the European Medicine Agency. Uh, right after, I'll call Leonardo Semprin, uh, who is Senior Director of Global Regulatory Policy Latin America at MSD. Uh, so he's based in Panama and he's a member of several networks dedicated to medicines regulation in the region, such as the Pharma, Epifia Latam, Pan America Network for Drug Harmonization, among others. And uh, last but not least, I'll call two uh, people from the San Juan de Del Barcelona Children's Hospital. But the first one of them will be the coordinator of patient participation in research, who's uh, a, a specialist on the, the team, uh, also doing her PhD on this uh, subject. And then we have Daniel Morin. So Daniel Morin is an inspiring, inspiring young person who's dedicated to, to involve young people, patients and non-patients in pediatric research and innovation in order to adapt both to the needs of uh, younger people. And uh, so now I'll call uh, Natalie. Natalie, please, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much for this uh, introduction and uh, good afternoon, good morning, in fact, to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today so that I can explain to you uh, patient engagement uh, at EMA. So if we go to the next slide. I think you have my slides, yeah. This is just a disclaimer that you can use the slides just to explain that they come from EMA. Uh, next slide, please. So, in case people are not aware, the European Medicine Agency is really the regulatory body in Europe who is responsible for um, assessing and approving medicines across Europe. So, this means that uh, any pharmaceutical companies, when they develop a medicine, they um, have to come to EMA and ask for an authorization. Now, EMA does other things. It gives advice to pharmaceutical companies when they are developing their medicine. Uh, we do guidelines. Lines. And of course, we also make sure that the medicine, when it is already being used, that it is safe. 25, just a little bit. And then we realized how valuable it was to have their input. So we developed formal uh, uh, working party with patients and consumers. We developed a framework of interaction, which was adopted by EMA's management board. We have a dedicated department just for ensuring that the patient voice is included everywhere. We have public hearings. We have involving young people many, many different ways. Today, systematic involvement of patients in all of our activities. Next slide, please. So this is to show you that we involve them along the medicine's regulatory life cycle. You know, when a medicine is developed, there are different phases. At the beginning is the pre-submission phase. This is when the companies are developing the medicine. And sometimes they come and ask us advice. We give advice and we involve patients as well so that we can make sure that the advice includes the perspectives of patients. We involve them during the evaluation of the medicines that we have uh, when they are coming for marketing authorization. And we involve them again in the post-authorization when the medicines are already out there being used. We also collaborate with other bodies, like we share lots of information with, for example, FDA and Health Canada, and we share information on um, how we engage together. We also, importantly, uh, interact a lot with the health technology assessment bodies. So this is also the authorities that are deciding which medicines will be reimbursed or which will be available in the country. So we also involve them in our activities as well so that we have this sharing of information. Next slide, please. So to show you a little bit more, uh, well, how do patients participate? So we have these different ways. So for example, we have scientific committees, uh, different committees for different things, sometimes for pediatric or orphan medicines or the authority committee. And on these committees, we have patients who are voting members. So they are full members like any other member on the committee. We have them involved, I mentioned earlier, in these scientific advice procedures, giving advice to the companies developing the medicine. Then when our committees are assessing the medicines, when they have questions they want to have answered, they involve patients, healthcare professionals, academics together, again, discussing the issues. We have stakeholder meetings as well, which are slightly bigger meetings. Sometimes we don't have time for a meeting, then we might do a questionnaire or a survey. Again, another way to reach out to patients and ask for their opinion. And we do public hearings, and this is when we have a very big forum, and a public hearing is broadcast live, so any member of the public can watch, they can send their comments, questions, they can join, they can give a presentation, a very open forum. Uh, we do also a lot of workshops, and we always invite patient representatives to join these workshops as well. And finally, as well, we send documents that we prepare for patients to make sure we are writing in the correct language, that it's not too technical or too complicated, that it's really uh, appropriate for patients to understand, like package leaflets inside the medicine boxes, 
maybe when we are doing a, a safety communication or things like this, we send all of these to patients for their comments on how it's been written. Next slide, please. So this is just, yeah, I explained, but it's showing you the public hearings when we listen to all the different stakeholders. I think we can go to the next slide. Uh, and this is the different documents that we sent for review. I mentioned earlier the package leaflets, the medicine overviews. This is an overview of when we authorize a medicine, we write a report and we do a question and answer document so that patients can also understand why we authorized the medicine or in some cases why we didn't authorize it. So we always give the information so that we can be transparent. Next slide, please. And this is another way that we engage with patients. And this is with the patients organizations and it's called the Patients and Consumers Working Party at EMA. So it's a group of uh, 22 different European wide patient organizations. Uh, it's formal, they are mentioned on our website. YAPO is one of these uh, organizations. And we meet four times a year um, with these organizations and we also reach out to them uh, for any consultations, written consultations at any time when we need to. Next slide, please. This just also shows you there are different ways that patients participate. Sometimes they come and they are representing the patient community, like on the management board or on the committees. Other times they are just representing their patient organization, or other times they are coming as individual patients with their own experience of a particular condition or as a carer of someone with a condition. Next slide, please. This showing you our networks, who we work with, so these uh, big European organizations. We also have a database where any individual can also register that they are interested to be involved with us, and then they can get involved as well as the organizations. Next slide, please. And here to show the different methodologies that are important. I think when we started working with patients, we understand that there needs to be a flexible way. Sometimes we involve patients face to face in a meeting, sometimes in writing, sometimes a survey or a preference methodology. And equally, we need to have support and training for patients getting involved. We have training days, we have information sheets, videos, and also one-to-one -one support. So when a patient is coming to get involved with EMA, we call them, we explain everything that they're going to be involved in, and we explain what is their role. Next slide, please. Of course, there are challenges, and it's important to work with the community to overcome these challenges. So it's difficult sometimes finding enough patients to be involved. Everybody is has their day-to-day -day lives. Sometimes they are not well, or sometimes they are busy, they have families. It's important to be able to accommodate everybody. Sometimes people don't speak English so well. We need to make sure that everybody uh, understands their uh, different uh, roles. Okay, I understand uh, it's a bit too long, so any questions? Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, it is uh, truly impressive, I would say, a dream. <laughs> uh, I would like to, you know, if we, we could hear from similar agencies and the different regions of, of the world, hope uh, soon we will. Um, and uh, now I'm going to call uh, Leonardo Semprun. Um, uh, Leonardo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. I will perform my presentation in Spanish. Voy a dar mi presentación en español. Eh, buenos días a todos. Agradezco primero que toda la asociación. Everyone. A la asociación internacional de. Thank you all. Sorry. Me. First of all, I want to thank IAPOS for giving me the floor, for inviting me 
And today I'll talk about the regional perspective about two topics that are not necessarily connected, but they have to do with all the regulation in the region. First of all, I want to talk about patient involvement in the regulatory procedures, and I'll explain how the situation in Latin America is, and then reliance as a practical way to regulate medical products. Next slide, please. So this is the agenda that we have for today. Next slide, please. There's something really important that I want to share, which is the role of regulation. We understand that we're talking about medical, scientific, and te technical knowledge within a legal framework. This way, we can talk about the quality, safety, and if efficacy. We should promote and protect everyone so that they have access to medicines. And we need to assess the risk radio and assess the life cycle. Next slide, please. Here in this graph, we can see how regulations support medicine development. First of all, based on what they said about the Europe agency, here we can see how important it is for us to learn from the mistakes, create strategies so that we can have clinical knowledge and also authorize new indications, new medicines, have continuous training, open the space for more countries, and this is related about the security in the long term. Here we can see that if we talk about regulation, we have an end-to-end -end procedures in all the life cycle of the medicines. So we work with evidence and assessment, and here the role of the patients is crucial because they live with the disease. So the patient is the best person to talk about this. They are core for us. The patients, they can know about the right evidence and how to make the best decision about different treatments. Next slide, please. In our programs, there is a question about the place that we have. So if they have a room to make decisions in Latin America, and here we can see that in order to play a full role in research and development, patients should and must be involved. Good practices are seen around the world. We could see that with the Europe medicine agency, but also FDA. In Latin America, we don't have a similar pathway in which patients can bring their perspectives in different processes during the evaluation. This is a recent experience and is growing in all the world. Participation of patients in different conversations that bring up best practices is really important for us. And I want to connect this with the importance of good practices in a regulation. Now I want to move to the next topic, which is reliance. So next slide, please. If we talk about best practices, here we can see that since the global system is really complex, supply chain, lack of resources around the world, we should talk about reliance. Reliance is something that is becoming more and more important. And I'll talk about reliance. Both in English and Spanish, we use the word reliance. And it's the act where regulatory authority in one jurisdiction may take into account and give significant weight to assessment. So the receptor is going to use their analogies so that they can keep their responsibilities. Reliance is becoming more important in all the region. We have different entities with different levels of capacity. 
they all work with this. Next slide, please. One of the main uh, advantages that we can see related to Reliance is how to make the best use of the resources so that we don't have to duplicate the effort. We should use the effort in the places that need them the most. We can see many advantages. If we talk about patients, they can have an early access to medical products, then if we talk about the national regulation, it's really important because we don't need to duplicate work. And if we talk about manufacturers, they can use what they have and they can have a timely approval. Next slide, please. Here we can see a graph. And we can see that Reliance as a mechanism can have many many ways of recognizing the evaluation of different regulation entities. Here we can see the difference and the relation. When we build trust between regulatory bodies, we can see the improvement on the processes. So we can adopt different ways of reliance and the reliance is going to get bigger and we're going to have more trust. So collaboration and dialogue are really important. This is crucial. Next slide, please. Here, I want to mention something really important. In sanitary emergencies, as the one we had with the pandemic, reliance procedures can be used so that the different agencies are ready to give a faster response. So here we can see the case of PAHO. They were giving advice to different bodies to give a better response, evaluating the risk, the benefits, security, and efficiency. And we can see how Reliance has been a very wide used practice. Now to wrap up on next slide, please. We can have some insights. As we've seen, regulation is core in medicine discovery and development. Patients have an important role to have this determination and make decisions on treatments the reliance is a functional and practical way of regulating, reg regulating the medical products. It can be used as one way of accelerating the approval and all stakeholders can have a potential of benefiting with this. I hope I give you a whole perspective of the two things. First of all, involving the patient, but also reliance of a way of having early access. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Leonardo, for your presentation. It is obviously encouraging to see the participation of people living with the health conditions participating in the regulation process in Latin America and how uh, you know meaningful this would be for the region considering cultural differences and obviously uh, other uh, also uh, health differences you know in, in these populations and and also understand the reliance so the, the importance for uh, you know advancing the regulation of medicines in uh, in our region um, and uh, now I'm going to call our two last speakers. So they, they recorded their participation because they, they were not able to, to be here with us today. So uh, Begonia Nafria and Daniel Murin. Hello, everyone. I'm the coordinator of the area in San Juan de Be in Barcelona. This is the pediatric hospital, one of the main, the, the most important ones in Spain and in Europe. In this case, we have the opportunity to present here the work that we do with Kids Barcelona Scientific Council. I'll share my screen. 
Kids for Salona is the scientific council for adolescents in San John de Hospital, created in 2015. 16 boys and girls took part in this initiative. Some of them are volunteers. For me, it is a pleasure to share this with you. I'll be here with Daniel Marin. He's the president of the group and he's, the stu he's a student of second year of medicine. The first thing that I want to share with you about Kids Barcelona is that it's a group interested in science, but we could empower and train them. In our schools, many young people and adolescents don't have a specific training in research, pediatric and drug development. This, together with innovation, is the main area of integration of Kids Barcelona Group. For this reason, at the beginning of the initiative, we developed training based on the four pillars that you can see on the screen. Biomedicine, clinical trials, innovation, and in general, clinical research. This training, together with other initiatives that we've developed and the theoretical and practical sessions, Allow, allow the boys and girls of Kids Barcelona to have the knowledge that they need so they can give their opinion, contribute and participate so that the research of the hospital is focused on the needs of the pediatric and adolescent population. This is another example of a training program. In this case, it was an initiative of the European Commission Steel Program and we've developed a program based on four pillars. Model one is based on the design of research projects with young people. Model two is about creation of protocols for health research. Model three, quality of life and patient reported outcome measures. And finally, model four, information on clinical trials for young people. These trainings are available to other groups such as Kid Barcelona that exist around Europe and around the world but also available for patient associations and acad academic centers that wish to introduce this in the clinical research. The training is absolutely practical and focused on real cases. Here on this slide, we have an example, which is a model dedicated to the design of research projects with young people. So we have Sally's story. Sally is a teenager girl suffering from lupus. Based on the situation, different challenging individual and group activities will allow young people to be encouraged to enter this world of clinical research. The activities can be carried out in groups with a supervision, and with the presence of teachers, coordinators, and different patient organizations. A relevant activity that we've recently carried out is the co-creation of the guideline for pediatric patient involvement. This is unique in Europe, and therefore, we think, around the world. Different agents involved in drug development have sat down to work hand by hand. These agents have been pharma industry, which is the federation of pharmaceutical companies in Spain working on clinical trials, and the Spanish Association. Then we have the CLIPI Network, the Spanish Network of Clinical Trials, with the leadership and supervision of the hospital, San Juan de Deux, and with young world and also parents who have allowed us to draft eight recommendations to ensure that any design of a pediatric clinical trial from the beginning to the completion takes into account the patient's perspective. This document is accessible and available on the Pharma Industry website. And if you want to know more about this, we'll share our email. We also work in close collaboration with the European Medicines Agency, the regulatory body that oversees and evaluates both the design of pediatric clinical trials and the authorization of new medicines in the context of Europe. One of the most relevant milestones that we had is that we created a guideline to regulate the activities of the European Medicine Agency. In this case, in the case of drugs that affect the pediatric population, the, e the EMA considers listening to patients 
um, they differed of different activities with different sponsors and different, different clinical trials. This document is also available on the website of the European Medicine Agency. I will now give the floor to Daniel Marin, the president of Kids Barcelona, who will share some examples of activities that we developed. And it was a great pleasure to be here with you today. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Begonia, for the presentation. As you said, I'll share some examples of the activities that we do in the group. This picture was before the pandemic, 2019. And this sums up who we are. We are patients. We are about 20 young people, boys and girls, some patients, some are not patients. But well, our main focus and our main goal is to help with different projects that are focused on different patients, youngest children, teenagers. So we help them with the process and we make sure that they are adapted to the needs of young people. One of the main rewards of the work that we do is that we know that we are help helping patients, children, and we know that we can do best. We can become better. And this is an example of a project that we did some years ago. In this case, it was a game dedicated to children who need speech rehab, so speech therapy. In this project, we were in charge of helping them. We collaborated in, for example, designing the avatars, the name of the game. It is an example of innovation to help children who need speech therapy, rehabilitation, so that they can have the tools and continue with their recovery process. One of the things that we do and we have been doing since 2016 is a meeting that we have once a year aimed to high school students. So the two previous years before entering college, two years before. So the last two years of high school in this case. And here we can see them in the auditorium and the goal, the objective that we had was to spread our work, explain everything to young people so that we can have this dissemination of our work. This is all related to a pediatric level. Everything that we do, as I said before, is at a pediatric level. So we spread knowledge about this. One of the examples is the creating of a comic book, explaining what the clinical trials are. So we, you can see the example, we help developing the dialogues, the cartoons, and we believe that the best way to spread our knowledge with children is in a way that is easy to understand. And we think that a comic book is a great example. It's an easy way to understand things as opposed to a very formal document in which the vocabulary is difficult to understand. So here with the comics, we can have this easy language so that children can understand what we do and what clinical trials are. A few years ago, in 2019, we received an award from the Spanish Society of Pediatrics. So it was an um, award recognizing our work and what's involved in the work that we do in kids and the results that we are going to have for the patients, the repercussion that we are going to have when young people come to the hospitals and the importance of all the work that we do. The sessions are not 100% theoretical. We also have practices. Here, for example, we went to a bio bank and we did a practical session extracting DNA from our own saliva. You can see it on the pictures. We had the saliva samples. And at the end of the day, we want to have practices. It's not only about theory, because with theory you learn, but then when you do it on your own, you retain much better. Here we have another example of spreading our knowledge. We have 
a meeting and a collaboration with our radio in Spain. We participate in a monthly program called and Another Way, and we have different meetings here um, with my colleagues. And well, as I said, we have it, we go there to the radio every month to explain what we do in the group. It depends on the month, but we talk about different topics. We go there as kids, as the group, and also with researchers and experts from the hospital so that we can spread information. Then we have the sessions, and we've learned a lot. We deal with current issues, and this is paradoxical, but a few months before COVID, we held a session about vaccines. We explain what the vaccines are, how they work, how they are administered, the epidemiology and different things, and you can see it on the picture. As I said, we deal with different things of our daily basis. So we debate and we learn. And many times we have experts. In this case, we had a doctor with us and she talked about vaccines. In this case, we have another picture that explains another important project. I liked and I enjoyed that a lot. It's a way of innovating. This project consisted of how to explain the diagnosis. We did a kind of a test, so to speak. So some of the kids explained the diagnosis in the traditional way with images, tags, and another group explained this with 3D models, so printed models of the tumor. So we could compare one, each, one group with the other one and we could see what the best explanation was, the 3D model versus traditional model. So then we did a survey and the results were really important. We could see that with 3D model, everything was much better to understand. So as I said before, we explained how 3D printing works, the innovation in this area, they explained everything quite well. So, well, this is it for me. I would like to thank you all on behalf of Begonia and myself for giving us the opportunity to explain everything that we do, our work, and above all, to make ourselves known in different countries. If you want more information, here's Begonia's contact. And if you have questions, Begonia and Daniel, Thank you very much. So inspiring your presentation. Hope next time you'll be able to, to join us here in this uh, discussion, in this conference. And uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that everybody here is learning so much as, as I am. And uh, just uh, to sharing here, uh, the numbers we have now, uh, 290 attendees watching us so it is um, so exciting and, and wonderful to know that uh, leaders from the, the entire Latin America and I believe other parts are with us uh, learning and, and obviously sharing and uh, and again I would remind you to um, to put your questions in the Q&A you find the Q&A in the uh, right side of your your screen um, and um, and I'll I'll invite uh, Natalie and Leonardo for some questions uh, to answer some questions we have already received. Um, but before that, I I'd like to to ask uh, Natalie to to be fair uh, if she could um, so complete her explanation on the challenges they have uh, you know faced with the the participation of, you know, people living with the, the health conditions in the process of regulation. I think it, it is an important topic and that, that interests us all. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, I mean, indeed, it's uh, important to address the challenges. I think it's important to address the challenges together with the patient community. So we had to look at uh, which were the best ways to make patient engagement as, um, how can I say, easy as possible for the patients participating, um, as streamlined but uh, as effective. So we discussed together with them which methodologies they preferred. Um, of course, challenges in Europe relate to language because in Europe we speak uh, many different languages. So of course, EMA's working language is English. So we try to uh, engage with patients that can at least speak English, but then some of the documents we also translate in all of the EU languages so they can understand. Um, other things that are a challenge are managing expectations. It's very important when a patient is getting involved in a particular activity that they understand what is their role. Some of the discussions on medicines and the, the clinical trial data is quite complex. So it's important that we understand where it's important for them to contribute, things that they can contribute that is important from their side, their daily burdens, living with a condition, what things they are looking for in a new medicine, what things they are hoping for. So these are the kind of challenges. Managing expectations, um, I think, is a key one. Thank you very much. Uh, and I have a question here uh, that I'll ask uh, Leonardo to answer. There is uh, what stops um, do you think should be taken in Latin America to accelerate the process of patient participation in health technology assessment? See, Mark. Can you hear me? Yes. Well. I think that within the resource research phase, it's important to promote the dialogue with patients through different organizations, as the activities that we are having today with the IAPOS and also with different Latin American organizations. There are many ways of having this dialogue and understand everything based on the evidence, based on the FDA experience, know about their challenges, lessons learned, know about the challenges and how we can involve the patients more and more. We've seen that when we talk about sanitary technology evaluation, there's a participation of patients in Argentina, Brazil and Colombia, for example, and I think that we should learn from this. This is something that is going to happen. As I said before, we are talking about a process that is ongoing around the world. And it is a re recent experience if we compare it with other regions. So I think that we should talk more about this we should participate in forums like this one and keep explaining all the Europe Medicine Agency and FDA experience because they are advanced on this and they are a reference for us. And then another important thing is that Latin America is really independent and in each country we have different bodies regulating so many times the efforts are local, but it's important to communicate within the region and share the different experiences that we are, are having. Another, I think the next, uh, I have a, another question here uh, to Natalie uh, from uh, Dr. Patricia Lucchi. There is, is also, so I'll link it to, to this, there is uh, from where should we start this process of, you know, bringing patients to the, the decision-making bodies. So what is the, the process to, to start inviting and, you know, giving also uh, power to them? 
so, uh, so I think if it's from the patient community side, I think patient organizations should reach out to the authorities and show them that they have valuable information to show them. I think it's, it's to show they want to be constructive and really work together so that everybody benefits. I think it's important that the authorities and, and the patients can both get something out of it. The patients can share their information and the authorities can then consider the information they receive so that at the end, the medicines or the health programs are better tailored to the needs of patients. And I think from the authority side, it's also just to open the door and listen to patients. And I would say do it in a stepwise approach like we did. It's, uh, you know, you need to start slowly, learn together what's the best ways to work together and then test it and implement it. Thank you, and I'll also um, bring another question to you, and Natalie, there is uh, related to, to, to training courses or capacity building, you know, opportunities for, you know, patients who, who participate. So uh, you also mentioned that this is one of the challenges to be ready to participate. So do you have, um, so training is available, maybe also if, if they, they are open, also Latin American uh, people would uh, take those trainings. Yeah, exactly. It's a very good point because some patients are very uh, knowledgeable on medicines regulation and other patients, of course, they do not know. So it's important that they can at least understand the basis. Now, there are different ways they can learn. I mean, for example, at EMA, we have materials available on the website. But also in Europe, there is a very uh, good system called UPATI which was a, a, um, a platform which was public-private, um, and they set up a whole system of educating patients. So there are whole training sessions that they can do. There are training materials, and all of this is available for patients. Um, and because it's online, I assume that even for you over there, you would be able to access um, the, the UPATI website. I think perhaps not attend the face-to-face -face meetings, but at least look at the materials they have available on their website, which is uh, enormous. Thank you very much. Uh, Leonardo, would you add something to, to this, to, to training opportunities or materials for, for people living with a certain condition would participate in? regulation bodies. Yeah, Mark. Yes, Mark, I think that due to the maturity process that we have on the region, I agree with Natalie. There are uh, websites, uh, so Patsy, showing the different mechanisms, how to collaborate, and this is something we can learn from in the region. This can be an example and we can start with something little and then make it bigger and this is amazing in our topics. Uh, regional regulation uh, body, regulatory body. Uh, me encanta esa pregunta. I really like this question. I think that the way in which the different bodies are organized, as I said before, are independent. There are many efforts in the region to share technical knowledge, but there is something cross, and it has to do with the maturity of the different regulatory bodies because they don't always have the same resources and availability. So we should compare the different tools that we have. We should compare the different entities and have some indexes, some figures to see how the agents are. And now answering the question, I would say that in Latin America, there's, there are many things to be done in terms of regulation. I think that we are not going to have it right now, but as I said about reliance, we can adapt this to the reality of each country. 
as an efficient way of regulating the medicines and have great advantages with different stakeholders as patients, for example, because of the different treatments, we can have an early detection and also the regulatory agencies because they can base the resources in the cases that are needed. And for the industry as a whole, because the industry globally works with different sources, with manufacturers, with supply. So there are many people involved in the legal processes so that a medicine can be approved. So I think this is a new to be for now, but there's something that we have ahead of us. Reliance nowadays is a concept that is becoming more and more important and that we can apply in our region. This is a reality. We've seen this in many life cycles of people. Another for you, uh, Leonardo, the, the question is if there is any uh, hospital or clinic in uh, Latin America, like the hospital uh, San Juan de Dil in Spain with this participation of you know, the pediatric population and research, you know, body uh, that you know. No, no tengo. I don't know about a similar case in hospitals, but I think that what is more developed in Latin America to involve patients is related to the organizations. So... This is a place where we can start from so that we can have more conversations and engage different bodies. As I said before, we don't have a legal procedure for now, so this is not part of regulation to authorize new medicines. Thank you. So we are getting close to the, the end of the session. I, I have a, a last question to, to Natalie. Is regarding the participation of you know uh, the people living with. So, how do how do you do to guarantee that their you know their their voices and their power is you know is is heard in a way that they don't feel uh, outnumbered or that also the different um, let's say social economic uh, you know status people are. You know, are participating not just you know middle class, which which we we, we hear very very often as a complaint. You know, it's just one the same class always was participating, and uh, you know, always even if we have power, we are outnumbered by other stakeholders. So at the end, our vote uh, you know doesn't uh, make a difference. So how do you deal with this? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. Um, I mean, on the one side, when patients are involved, they are treated equally like any other experts, whether it's a healthcare professional, a scientist or anyone, they are treated the same way and they all have the same vote or they have the same uh, ability to make their comments, um, which would show up then in a minutes of a meeting or in an assessment report of a medicine. So I think it's important that the patients understand that their voice is important. Of course, they are representing a different kind of knowledge and expertise, but it is equally important. And on the other side, of course, it's difficult to reach out to every kind of patient. We work a lot with the European um, patient organizations and, you know, international like YAPO, and we also hope that they are trying to reach out to the patients who are not necessarily the ones who are always uh, getting involved. I think nowadays with social media, maybe with uh, using the, the different channels, we can reach out to patients maybe who are not even members of a patient organization, but they are interested to be involved. So I think it's about finding different ways of reaching out using social media. Thank you. We have just received another question to, to Leonardo, uh, which is, what is the industry? What is industry doing to impact the regulatory agencies to include patients in the decision making? How to articulate these actions with the government bodies? Well, 
So, generally speaking, the industry have different groups that work with patient engagement related to the decision making to authorize a medicine, for example. This is in an early stage for now. We have many things to do in this. And I think that as part of the first international congress of patients organizations in Latin America, this is a good example of how to promote the dialogue, the conversation, and how to use the experiences from other contexts to develop this relation with the regulatory bodies. I think that through the industry and through the work that we do, we do with different people, we had many lessons learned. Everything that we are seeing with the Europe Medicine Agency, the FDA, it can be used in our region now. So every developer of the different medicines, they are facing this process. So this is happening in Europe and the United States. They are involving the patients and we should learn from them so that we can reduce the gap and that we can move forward and speed up the process. But, well, we have different groups working to, to involve people in the region. Another outages. Uh, add also that so the different um, global organizations and multilaterals are also uh, so participating in this encouragement of including always the voice of the patients or people living with certain conditions in the decision making process for policies and programs we, we have been partnering a lot with um, WHO and CD Alliance so all of them on this also process of you know encouraging the, the governments also to to make sure that uh, you know people living with health conditions are, are heard and participating with uh, with vote or the different uh, different phases of, of policies and, and programs the countries well uh, this is our the last minute of our session so I'd like to thank you all very much, the, the speakers. Uh, so um, Begonia and Daniel, that were not here, but you know, sent amazing uh, videos and uh, Natalie and Leonardo. So for you know, a very, uh, very, very good presentation. So showing us that we are uh, moving in the right direction of engaging people in the regulation of medicines and uh, medical devices. And uh, and hope to 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 keep keep this conversation uh, much further in in in, uh, in the second uh, conference. Hope that soon we we'll have the, the announcement of the second Latin American conference, and we mm -hmm. show more progress in this area. Thank you very much. To all. thank you. Bye bye. Oh, thank you for this great session. They shared so many things and we can see what we have ahead of us. We are almost 300 people live with us. I hope you are sharing everything on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook with the hashtag CellAPC2022 and Congress of Pacientes Latam. In this session, I identified myself with Daniel because he is young and he is involved and many of us, we were young and in my case, I'm trying to learn from the tools that we have. So in this case, in PIDAR, we have a group of leaders that provide many tools so that we can have a voice and we can empower the changes and improvements for us from the, for different patients so that we can have a say because every decision matters for us. And now we're going to have a five minute break. We'll be back at 11.30 a.m. Mexico time for the fourth session. We are going to talk about medical 
and health systems based on value. Remember that you can download your participation certificate. You can take a picture as well, as I said before, and share on social media. And all the different posts are going to be available in our booth. So keep tagging us, posting. Remember that we have the exhibit hall where Yayapo and Ayapo members have set up virtual stalls with different resources about their work. They are going to be available throughout the Congress and they will have a live representative. You can talk to them if you have questions. You can also learn about the work of IAPO through the videos that are going to be available in the auditorium during the break. Thank you all once again and we'll see you back shortly. Grab, grab a coffee and come back.